All right, welcome to another True Crime Show and Tell. I'm here with uh, Evan Taylor. He's a murder billia collector, and uh, I want you to introduce a little bit about yourself and, you know, what got you into collecting and what collecting means to you before we get into these uh, two cases. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, Andrew. It's, uh, I think I mentioned it to you earlier, it's the first time I've done something like this, so I'm pretty excited. So, um, yeah, 34-year-old Greek male from... Uh, well, born in Toronto, Ontario, uh, lived most of my life in uh, London. That's where I'm at now. Um, as far as, you know, how I kind of got into collecting, I'm sure it's with, you know, most people. I started off with horror movies as a kid, probably, you know, watching them inappropriately young. And, you know, that kind of got me interested in, you know, the monsters and all those really, really those things that other people were really, really afraid of. And eventually when I started getting on the internet more, I started seeing, you know, people were writing these people or there was art and all this stuff. And I didn't know for years you can, you know, start collecting that. And then I finally kind of found out you could. And, you know, I did, you know, a few years looking at the groups like everyone did and doing my Wikipedia searches and uh, eventually, got my first piece and it was just you know it was so strange that first one being like okay this was you know done by somebody I'd researched you know like physically even though it was just a small little you know just a little cut signature at the time it was just so freaky for me and you know I just it that's what kind of started it I just wanted to have a little bit more and a little bit more and you know I not a huge collector, this might lead you to believe otherwise, but you know, slowly over the years, I just started getting more and more of it. And it's just so crazy to me that you can look at the history of some of these people, read the cases a million times, watch every documentary you can, and then read a cake recipe, right? Or see a Christmas card with, you know, different quotes from the Bible. And yeah, that's pretty much it. It's uh, aside from maybe Ghostbusters, my passion as far as hobbies outside of professional life. You went, yeah, you mentioned like when you get your first piece, it is almost like, a, you know, addictive. When I first started, I, I first started writing Philip Jablonski, then I went on to like Bruce Davis and Wayne Henley, and then like, 200 300 400 inmates like 13 years later um, <laughs> have you know all this stuff you know that i've accumulated over the years as well so it's it definitely you know gets addicting and it's interesting especially like you said you know researching somebody say like you know i, I everybody knows richard ramirez and you know one day i was on the bus you know going back from college back to job court it's like you have a prepaid call from richard ramirez <laughs> i was like maybe 21 22 years old and it's like, I don't know what the hell to say to this guy. <laughs> yeah, just... especially when you're on a bus full of people, right? Like, right. I was in my seat. I was like, hello, hello, <laughs> like trying to be trying to be real quiet. Keep it quiet. Yeah, yeah. like my I was kind of lucky when it came to first piece. Actually, well, I got it from uh, you and it was BTK. So not something, you know, I, I saw a lot of people getting, you know, those basic at the time, Jablonskis and all those things. So I just was so blown away that I was able to have this. But yeah, I remember I was telling someone this, I've told the story a million times, the first thing that I ever saw for sale, the first piece of murderabilia I ever saw for sale was one of Kearney's little snails, right? The little snail hand tracing. And as as much as I have, I still don't have one of those, even though there's a million of them. And it was the first thing I ever saw. Yeah, I don't I don't remember what the first thing I saw was for sale, but it's, I don't know, probably Manson or something like that. But um, yeah, you hear that a lot with Manson. Yeah, yeah, there is so much then and there's even so much now. I mean, you know, like, his 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 uh signature kind of skyrocketed when he died and then not long after that it just kind of stayed around the same where it really was <laughs> but um if it was your first one did you get caught with a good one or a bad one right 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 i've never i've never had a 
a, a fake Manson that I know of, but I've never got caught with any that I know of either. <laughs> but <laughs> knock on wood. Right, right. So I want to talk about uh, two cases today in which um, you have, you know, a few things that you uh, have displayed, which in the first being is Maxim Gelman. And he was a, I guess you could call him a mass murderer, mass stabber or spree killer, you know, from uh, New York City, New York. And so the total amount of victims were four killed and five injured. And every uh, the, the weapons used were uh, a chef's knife, a carbon fork and a car and this I remember when this was on the news, actually, they were looking for the person that was doing this and people were just randomly getting stabbed in New York and assaulted and carjacked. And I remember this dude being arrested and watching him on TV, these these interviews. And I think it was I am a killer or something like just total disregard for the victims, families and the surviving victims. And I was just watching something um, like some mini documentary and one of the victims uh that survived was sitting in court and he 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 was saying uh he kept like smirking at him you know the whole time and he was thinking can i just kill him can i kill him in the courtroom you know because he was just getting so upset seeing him smirk at the victim's families and um I mean, yeah that was the guy at the end right uh was it joe lazito the one that was getting stabbed right in uh, front of the door with the idiot cops just kind of hanging out behind him yeah, I believe that was him. Yeah, I believe that was him. And um, uh, yeah, Gelman, I, I know I know his like M.O. or whatever at first. I know he killed his stepfather first and he I know they got in an argument over wanting to take his car because he, he said what like the DEA or the FBI or something was after him. And yeah, I think it was DEA. Yeah, he's paranoid because he's like this small time drug dealer, supposedly, or something like that. And he he Mad he, Max. Yeah. Yeah, Mad Max. Yeah, that was yeah, that was his nickname, Mad Max. Yeah. Yeah, and he uh just went on a stabbing spree and carjacking spree and he's doing what uh 200 and something year sentence or or, or something like that. Uh Yeah, I think it's two. Like I never saw it on the news like you did. I I did the same thing after it had already happened. I saw that Killer Speaks or whatever it was TV show. And same thing, he was just, like you mentioned with the court, he was just completely chilled out and completely just didn't give a fuck, it was just going off. It was just like fun for him. And, you know, I, I've i mentioned this before when I've talked about this, it's, it was one of the first, or at least back in my early days, first real time seeing somebody that I was just like, okay, this yeah, this is kind of what I thought I would get it. I'd, I'd be seeing when I started looking at documentaries and stuff. These are the kind of people that I thought were behind some of the murder murderbilia and stuff. Like it made a little bit more sense. You know, I know he's an outlier for, you know, that kind of attitude in some of these interviews, but it was still, that's what started to kind of connect at that point. Right. And uh, so you, you have a couple things uh, from Gelman, right? Yeah, I just got these uh, like a month or so ago. I, I For the longest time, I didn't know that there was a lot of him out there. And I had seen very little, always wanted it. And I got the opportunity and I had to pick it up. Like it's obviously, you know, a lot of people that are going to be watching this know all that worth and most are going to know that. And you know, it's not the most expensive thing in the world by far, but I was so fucking happy when I got it and it's just yeah it's one of those pieces from one of those cases that started out early that I was just happy to have so I tried to clean it up as best I could but yeah this is a little graffiti piece I guess there's a little bit of a glare that he's kind of stuck uh, a couple photos of him on hmm so is that that's like know. like colored pencil or markers or colored pencil? So he's got Mad Max kind of written there if you can see it in red. Yeah. And then I'm just trying to make sure you can see, kind of see the photos that he glued on there. But yeah, and it's, like I said, it's basic, but I I loved it. It's up in my living room actually. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty, uh, 
Interesting. I've seen some of his graffiti art out there over the years, but I haven't really seen much other than that and and letters and you know whatnot. And I've tried writing them over the years, but I've never been able to get a response from him. I've heard that's the case for a lot of people. Um, yeah, I also got the little like the letter. It's you know, it's it's pretty kind of basic as most are, but one of the good th or cool things about it is it's got these little like kind of dorky little smiley faces all over them, which, you know, for me, I, anytime there's something kind of dorky or a little smiley face on something, it makes it, I don't know, just a little bit cooler, I guess yeah 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 little little doodles here and there on the the letters or whatever yeah the more the further it is from something you'd expect from like if if i was talking to say a neighbor and said hey i've got this letter from maxim gelman he went nuts in november and stabbed a bunch of people they think that the letters are going to be just gory and brutal and just all this horrible stuff and then you show them and I think it would just completely surprise them. And that's, I, I, those are the, some of the things that I like to have. And that's just, it doesn't matter that it's, if it says something really, really horrible or something really detailed or graphic, it's more that the person that I, you know, looked at their case for so long has now made something that's just completely out of left field for what you'd expect and is hilarious. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but it's, I think it's kind of funny. Right, right. Another uh, uh, New York case uh, that I want to talk about that everybody should know is, you know, the Ronald DeFeo, you know, junior case, the, which was made famous, you know, of course, through Amityville Horror, the, the horror series. And, of course, everybody knows that Ronald DeFeo was either, what, drugged up or, you know, on alcohol or both and ended up killing his family, uh, his mom, dad, two brothers and two sisters. And... There's been a million conspiracies over the years where his his uh I think Uncle Peter DeFeo was a um he was a capo in the Genovese crime family and he had them whacked and then the sister killed everybody and then Ronnie and her were struggling over the rifle, then he killed her accidentally and then he drugged them all and then killed them, but they were never proven to be drugged up. So there's been a lot of conspiracies over the years, but um that case Yeah, is I saw a bunch about like Don killed one person. No, Don killed two people. Don killed all of them. And it was just Ronnie that was there. And yeah, it's uh, not exactly like the Ryan Reynolds movie. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And uh, yeah, DeFeo, uh, that's one of them that's, that's you know, like so iconic. Just just because I think of the, you know, Amityville Horror series. And of course, you know, after after that mass murder, the Lutz, what was it? Uh, was it Kathy and George Lutz? you know, moved into that home and they said that it was haunted and demonic and all that. But of course, over the years, people have, there's been like people that have debunked it and, but who really knows? I mean, that, that house will be famous no matter what. Um, yeah. See, just even aside from murderabilia and murder cases, as much as I, I, I mentioned Ghostbusters to pretty much everyone I talked to, but as much as I grew up with that, I, I've never been into this ghost and demonic lore when it comes to Ronnie and like the case and any of his pieces and you know ever since I started collecting I've always seen that like oh I just got a Ronnie DeFeo piece is my house going to be haunted now or am I going to start hearing stuff and it's just never it's oh it's never been about that and so whenever I started looking into like this was years ago but I didn't know about the case at all. I thought the Amityville horror was actually just the Ryan Reynolds movie. Hmm. Like, like this shows how kind of late I got into the game for some of this, but I thought I, I saw the movie, thought it fucking sucked. Then I found out about it. So it was never the thing that got me to that wasn't even the, like the Ed and Lorraine stuff or any of the, the haunting stuff. So yeah, I don't think my piece is haunted. I don't know how I got to that point. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people that always ask me the same thing. And it's like, I have so much stuff. I even have a necklace that Sarah Aldretti had uh, blessed. And there's supposedly like a Nigerian man's spirit inside. And 
I've never had anything crazy happen with anything and everything I have and figure if anything was haunted, I would have definitely had something happen by now. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not saying that I've got nearly that amount, but if anything is going to be, it's going to be this guy. And I haven't had a light flicker like I'm in Stranger Things or anything like that. So I think I'm pretty good. Just wait till later tonight until it happens. <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> i'm sleeping with all the lights on <laughs> you have a uh, you have yeah, a couple so... oh. yeah i just got the uh this guy here it's uh you know i know it's not the craziest thing in the world from him but it's uh you know a love letter or a love card to his girlfriend on the outside so like even bits of it it's kind of miss uh mushy i miss 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 you too much you're my reason for living miss you miss you miss you i true yeah i truly ha can't what you are okay and everything like it's just absolutely bonkers it'll say stuff and then it won't say stuff so this was another one i actually got this from a collector buddy for christmas a few years ago but I, I mentioned it earlier it's one of those things it's not what you're going to expect what not what a normal person would expect from somebody that you know killed their parents and their two brothers and their two sisters it's a mushy card that a stupid 17 year old would send to their high school girlfriend if they're separated for a summer right like so it's it just makes it that much just more kind of weird is the person's name on that Nissa? Yep. That's actually his that's actually his ex-wife. I I ex-wife. Yeah, I, I spoke to her a few times actually. I uh she actually contacted me wanting to sell a bunch of letters and I didn't think it I didn't think it was a legit thing until I looked her up and I was like, holy shit. So I probably had <laughs> like 70 letters and probably like 50 or 60 cards at one point in time. And um a lot of those letters and cards were x-rated like i want to do this to you i want to you know i want you to do this to me and <laughs> just see that's a little bit more in line with what people would think would be in a lot of the stuff right yeah or at least in my humble opinion there was there was a few letters too where, where he was wanting her to like um file th certain things in court like i don't know if they were lawsuits or like restraining orders or whatever but against certain like politicians in new york because they were denying his his letters or requests to like get out of prison or get into court or something something crazy like that i wish i still had photos of everything because it was literally a gold mine and i i sold everything i sold probably the last one probably months before he died <laughs> but you know it is what that it is. was yeah that was uh no offense poor timing on your part yeah but I, I i made i made everything back probably times like 20 you know so i still made out like a band. Yeah, mine came from that collection yeah 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 i, I wish i still had some left but i uh you know had had got rid of um you know all them by now before um before we get out of here um do you want to talk a little bit about uh well i guess like a little bit about what's what's back on your wall like what what are what else do you have that's you know hanging up back there that might be some names that you know people might recognize um do you want like more so like dead dudes either or like i i got my like i got two favorite pieces if you want me to show you those and they're okay. both dead dudes yeah that's cool all right, let me just stand up here and make sure my pants are pulled up. All right, so the, these are probably top one and top two for me. And it's one of the things that always bugs me with collecting is people saying that you need to have heavy hitters or these big names or you need to have a Bundy and a Gacy and a Dahmer to be 
a good collector, right? It, it's not about that. It's what you like. If you like just, if you wanted to collect a million and one, you know, Jablonskis, that's your thing. You got passion for it, do it. So in that kind of light, this is a Jablonski. So one of my early, early things that I were cases I really loved was Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. So he's one of the only people I have multiple letters from and different types of letters. And I saw this and had to get it. It's super basic, but it's a little painting that Jablonski did of Sutcliffe. So I have it sitting up there with a couple Sutcliffe letters and it didn't cost anything because, you know, Jablonski was alive when I got it. But it's been my second favorite thing ever. And then same kind of deal as cheap stuff. Uh, one of the first things, and sorry if I'm kind of ranting and rambling here, but um, yeah, the one of the first cases I ever really got sickened by. And in the beginning, I was like, why the fuck am I looking at this stuff? Like, what kind of sick person am I? Was Bitteker and Norris. All right, so after I read their transcript, I stopped looking at everything for like three months and then I started getting back into it. So it was one of the first things that really got me hooked. So I made this little display and this is, again, a really cheap thing, but it is a business card, Lawrence Bitteker, serial killer. And then he signed it, Del S. Bitteker at the bottom. And I just threw it in a little frame with uh, the Roy Norris postcard. So yeah, it cost me nothing at the time. It's compared to, you know, a Bundy or Gacy or, you know, another one that I really love is, you know, Coral Eugene Watts and his stuff's always, you know, it, not expensive, expensive, but higher than this. But it's just my favorite. I love it. It's probably out of everything I got, even the Berkowitz, Brutos, Ramirez, I'll never get rid of.